Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Nick Padgett. I'm here with uh, Dealer Match. I'm going to give you a kind of a little brief preview of what we're doing at Dealer Match. Um, talk a little bit about the uh, technology, um, the uh, process, as well as we're hiring. Um, at Dealer Match, uh, we're using a variety of things, you know, Ruby as well as Mongo as our backend database. Um, but uh, to give you a quick overview of Dealer Match, we allow dealers to buy and sell and trade uh, inventory amongst each other. So if you uh, are a car dealer or actually a consumer, you drive up to a car dealership, you want to trade in your, uh, your Camry for a Lexus, that Lexus lot isn't interested in keeping your Camry, ar Camry around and want to sell it off to another car dealership. Or maybe you can't, as a car dealer, keep a particular car in stock and you want to replenish your inventory. You can either go to a wholesaler or you can go to a, um, uh, a auto auction place like uh, Mannheim Auto Auctions. It takes time, money, etc. So here we are to uh, insert ourselves into the market and allow car dealers to trade amongst themselves directly. Um, we're a startup. We're funded, well funded uh, by Cox Enterprises. We've been around for two years. Um, we're up in the uh, Dunwoody area. Uh, our sister, what's that? We're sister company to OVE. Yep. So uh, other sister companies are Auto Trader, Mannheim Auto Auctions, Kelly Blue Book. Uh, how many of you guys have used Mongo? A good deal of you. Um, where was everyone here like uh, three months ago when they gave the last presentation on Mongo? How many people? I thought I heard Lance's voice in the presentation. Yes. We okay. get a presentation right afterwards. Uh, so. Cool. Um, so, what is Mongo? Uh, MongoDB is an open source database that stores uh, schema less JSON like database objects. Uh, it's not a relational database, so not like MySQL or Postgres, uh, and it's not a key value store like Redis or Memcached. Uh, instead of tables, you have collections. Instead of rows, you have uh, collections. Or excuse me, instead of rows, you have documents, uh, NoSQL database. A little blurry, um, but this is what uh, the document looks like. It looks a lot like JSON. It's actually stored as a document type called BSON. It's an open source document framework. Uh, why did we choose it? Uh, we went with Mongo because it gives us the flexibility to store data about uh, what we're interested in at the disadvantage of taking up a little bit more space on the database. So we get information from a lot of different places, uh, cars.com, AutoTrader, uh, and there's several other major feeds that are sending us data on a daily basis. So we're processing somewhere on the uh, size of five million new, uh, or five million records a day are coming in about the uh, car market to us from those sources, about like 30 gigabytes of data. So we need to take in that data on a regular basis process it fast and efficiently, and get that into our database. Um, so I wanted to talk about how we do that. So uh, to give you a, a picture of what it looks like, uh, you know, it's pretty much a, a search service to a large degree for customers to come in and find vehicles. So they'll go in, ask, in, or they'll put in information about like make, model, trim, et cetera, uh, or type in like keyword search for the vehicles. So uh, we have kind of two usage patterns for Mongo. We have two applications. Our web applications primarily like read-based where people are performing searches and users are allowed to make, uh, you know, they can go make offers on cars. We throw them into auctions. So there's some uh, you know, transaction-like uh, data that we store in the database. And we also have an ETL application that we take that five million records of data and try to get it back into Mongo as quickly as possible. Um, why do you have you have a million cars? Yep. Why do you have five million new cars a day? Uh, there, so there's there's a car market for both used cars and new cars. Majority of the people that we're trying to sell are we're trying to sell them used cars. Also, there's business reasons that when you come in as a car dealer to uh, buy a like as a wholesaler. Just because we're getting all the 5 million cars from AutoTrader and Cars.com doesn't mean 5 million cars are available for sale to a retailer. So as a car dealership, I 
I may be more willing to sell a car to you at a lower price than I would be able to sell to a dealer because you may come back to my dealership and you're going to invest in me. You know, I'm going to fix your car. I'm going to maintain your car. I'm going to get incremental revenue on there. And so when a car shows up, it may not be, a de car dealer may not be interested in selling it to a wholesaler or another dealer for 40 days or so. So we, through our, our business intelligence, we go in and we identify what we think the cars aren't for sale and just don't even make them available. Because if you're gonna come in as a user and use our site and you make an offer on a car and you never get a response, that's not gonna be a, a good uh, user experience. So we do a heavy amount of, uh, Analy or we analyze our data very heavily to identify what is for sale and what is not. Does that help answer? Uh, Ken, you wanted to add something? I'll just add is that we have like, I don't know, like six different feeds, and there's sometimes duplicate data. So one person says, this car's here, and this is the details, and another feed says, well, no, the car's really over here, and here's the data, and so we have to normalize it. So in some cases, we also have duplicate records Come That's in and also we have to normalize it amongst different feeds. So we have like feeds from Hertz. We have you know tremendous amount of different data from different sources, and we normalize it so we can give the dealer the dealer marketplace a normalized view. That makes sense. Also, I mean, this is aged inventory, so it's been sitting on lots for forty days. Anything less than forty days doesn't show up. Yeah, at a certain point, once a car's been on my lot for a car dealer, I'm losing money on that car and I want to get it off my lot either to a customer or another car dealer and bring on something that might sell. There was a million in inventory that stayed at 30 days on the average, so you had 30,000 turning over a day. Yeah, so, so we, we have... A factor of 100. Yeah, so we have like a, a thousand... A factor of six, you account for out of 100. And I guess... So we have about a thousand of the 80, 90,000 dealerships out there. For those thousand, we're showing all their inventory. For everyone else, we're showing aged inventory, right? Something that's 40, 45 days or more. Um, and the data that we're getting, these are advertisements. So we have to translate what is an advertisement and try to match up what is what actual vehicle is for sale to a wholesaler. Um, so these two applications have two different usage patterns. Uh, the ETL application, uh, when we're trying to get in all this data, uh, we're performing a lot of writes into Mongo. So one of the, you know, uh, one of the limitations of Mongo is its locking structure. It allows you to, it has a lock at the database level. So if I'm writing to a collection or I'm writing a, a document uh, in a collection or modifying a document, it's going to put a write lock on the entire database. It also prefers write locks over read locks. So say I have a long running write lock, and that's taking, uh, or, or say I have a bunch of write locks, it's not gonna allow any read locks to go through until the write locks are finished. So this is of particular concern to us, right? We wanna get the data from the five million records into the system without causing the website to stop running. Um, so we do that in a couple of different ways with Mongo. Uh, the one is we can pull some information out of Mongo to run diffs against the data to identify what has actually changed between yesterday and today. And then we only write the change set back into Mongo. Uh, with that, you can do you can process these in batches and do what is also known as like a slow burn, taking once you do a series of writes, giving enough period of time between the writes to allow any reads that might have queued up get in between. Um, Mongo stores everything, or Mongo wants to store everything in memory. So if your database is of the appropriate size, most of these transactions are going to go through very quickly, um, and it's pretty easy to monitor whether or not your uh, Mongo, if whether or not Mongo is uh, being performant for you. Um, so any of the, even though the the lock is at the database level, this has not been a problem for us, uh, even at the number of records that we have. We have some hundred million records in the database, and we're uh, processing about five million a day. Um, the major issues that we have had with Mongo are more developer-related issues. Uh, developers writing n plus one queries instead of uh, instead of optimizing, you know, only hitting a collection once per request. Uh, say not having a, a database machine large enough to fit the Mongo database in memory. Um, 
and a couple other things like that. Uh, so, if you can fix, if if you can address any of the development issues, uh, once we address the development issues, Mongo has been able to scale to our needs. Um, so that was my presentation on Mongo. Um, okay. I know Paul's going. This might be interesting too. Just talk about our experience in solar. So if anybody does that, because I know that's all the search results all solar, right? Yeah, uh, we use solar with Sunspot. Um, there's a there's not a very good maintenance of the mong. Uh, there's like a Sunspot Mongoid gem out there. I think the most active one is Sunspot Mongoid two. Uh, not very active community, but it just kind of seems to work. Um, we uh, all the search on the site is driven through uh, Sunspot. Right now, uh, because of the ETL process, we want to disable. Um, we don't. We want to like stop uh, rights to the solar database because we want to push out a massive amount of records, and we don't want them to change significantly. And lock up solar, so we actually have two solar servers running. They're both, you know, master solar instances, but one replicates to the other, so it just uh, accumulates a bunch of rights over a period of time and sends it off. Um, we haven't had to deal with any of the scaling issues with solar. Um, we're, we have uh, around, here you see one million records, but we actually have around two million records that are um, indexed on a daily basis. So um, before we move on, does anyone have any questions? What's your total search set size though? Right. You actually are running it? Two million. Right. So actually the entire set that you can search, that's actually being searched against in solar is about two million records then? Yep. Okay, so it's really small then. Yep. Yeah. What was the, you're, are you using Mongoid as like an ORM for uh, MongoDB? Yeah, um, so for the web app we're using Mongoid, but for the ETL process we're using Mongo. Um, we recently upgraded a Mongoid um, from like two to three a few months ago. Uh, it has some pros, but there's a, a lot of cons, especially around like caching of documents that may not exist in the query, or caching of, um, relations. So if I have a say a vehicle and it has a bunch of maybe offers but a particular vehicle doesn't have any offer, Mongoid doesn't like uh, negatively cache that the fact that there are no offers associated with it. So it cause a bunch of needless hits to the database. So we've run into some issues um, but it, it does provide a lot of accessibility options. Um, but yes, Mongoid with the web app and Mongo with the ETL process. We don't have the overhead of Mongoid. Yep. Can you speak to the, you know, back in the earlier stages before the system existed, what, how the decision process went for deciding to use Mongo versus, you know, some other database technology? And was it just that it was obviously the right answer or was there a specific, you know, use case that was, this is better? Yep, uh, great question, and one I wish I could answer for you. Um, <laughs> uh, no, uh, when, I, when I came on, we were rolling off from contractors over to uh, full-time employees, so about the first year existence of the company was contract development through ThoughtWorks. Um, so I had not had the opportunity to talk to the original developers about why they made that decision. I think it was probably a matter of someone had an interest or had used the technology prior, and that was really the driving factor of using it then. Um, since then, right, we've run into our own internal scaling issues, but these all turned out to be developer-related issues that could be easily fixed. And uh, we've actually uh, worked pretty closely with the folks at Mongoid to, you know, draft out, you know, what does our plan look look like for the next six months, next year, and next several years, and Mongoid's going to scale for our needs. So, you know, there is no compelling reason to move away from it, the, but the most compelling reason why we use it today is that flexibility in the document structure. The information I get from Hertz is a lot different than the information I get from AutoTrader or Cars.com. They have a different set of uh, fields, right? You know, everyone has a make, model, trim, VIN, year, et cetera. Um, there's a whole slew of other things like rental history, right? You wouldn't see that on auto trader vehicle. 
So the Mongoids, uh, or excuse me, Mongo's document structure allows us to easily add in those additional fields without having to go do a migration of a table and add additional column and incur downtime for the 10, 20 minute period it takes to add that additional column. What about analytics? You talked about you guys do a lot of analytics. Uh, our BI team does a lot of analytics. Uh, they recently started moving over to Redshift. Um, they have, what is the, uh, what are they using right now? Well, I could just add to be, we're not, we're at, they're, they're right now they're actually normalizing MySQL, but they're moving it over to Redshift right now. And so there's a lot of interesting things going on where you guys are, we're actually doing it where they can predict it and say, you know, I make an offer in this car, it's rejected who's most likely to sell me that car and searching through all of these records. And so it's a lot of interesting stuff, but Redshift is what we're moving to, which is Amazon service. And MySQL is what we're using for the BI. MySQL and Pen Taha, I believe. Pen Taha as well. But that's, there's a lot of interesting things we can do with this data. Uh, Five million records doesn't sound like a lot when you're talking about big data these days, but it's every used car in America. Nobody else has that. That sounds like a machine learning problem, actually. Oh, there's a lot of new stuff. We got <laughs> we're over the yeah. so, so, what, so what we're showing you right now is the, um, you know, we're showing you insight in the 5 million vehicles, but we actually have a snapshot of what the entire vehicle market looked like for every day since we've been in existence. So we know every dealer's, for every dealer in the United States, we know who they've traded with, who they bought vehicles from, who they've sold vehicles to, what type of vehicles they bought and sold. Every so, single one of those is whether they're our, even if they're not our customer. Even if they're not our customer, we have that information. So we're able to go in and when we go sign up a customer, we're able to tell you, you know, based on your buying history, I already have these guys who are trying to sell a car at a price point that meets or beats what you normally pay. And we're on the, you know, part of our sale is, hey, I've just put four cars on your lot or taken four cars off your lot that you needed and um, you know, immediately showing them the business opportunity. So you know, what does that next thing look like right now? You see static searches. Uh, this is gonna turn into active searches or active alerting. Um, when we, when if someone goes on, puts, changes something about the vehicle, that all of a sudden becomes a, something interesting to you, and we have the data to know if it's interesting to you, we'll be able to text message you or email you or somehow let you know this vehicle is available for sale um, out of the five million vehicles possible, so. And will we make that exclusive to one dealer, or will we broadcast that to? We're, we're going to tell everyone who's interested, right? Because we have, we have, buy, we want to serve you as a buyer and a seller. There's no exclusivity in here. Price I'm going to try and sell it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're willing to buy the car, right? <laughs> okay. So uh, Paul's going to come up and talk a little bit about our uh, process. We hope you've enjoyed this video presentation of a talk given at a monthly Atlanta Ruby Users Group meeting. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. As an Atlanta-based Rails consultancy, Rietta transforms high-level business problems into technical solutions. For more videos like this one, please see the ATL ROG videos playlist.